Welcome to the I Work For Him podcast. I'm Michael Mariko, producer of the I Work For Him radio program, the voice of the faith and work movement. Our mission is to transform the workplace of every Christian into a mission field. What does that look like in your workplace? Let's find out right now. You've tuned into I Work For Him, the mouthpiece for the faith and work movement. We're Jim and Martha Brangenberg, your hosts for the day. Welcome, everybody. We're so glad you're here. I feel like I need to start with a question because that's what we're going to be talking about today. The, the professional question asker is our guest today. Um, so let me think. Did you know that we are on social media? Did you know we are on social media? The Did you know we have a YouTube channel? So this is one of the things that you can learn about us, that you can watch our interviews, see our guests. Today, you have quite an eyeful of things that you can see there with our <laughs> guests. His desk is full of all of his wonderful um, books and everything. So make sure you you go to the YouTube channel, I Work For Him, and join us there. That's right. And did you know we have the Awaken Podcast Network? We'll have to tell you about that in a future mm. podcast. All right. Are you a leader in any way? Are you a teller or a question asker? I tend to be a lecturer myself. Today, our guest is Bob Teedy, who has made a profession of leading with questions because great leaders ask questions. Did you know that Jesus asked a ton of questions? Bob even counted them all. Do you know the number? Bob's going to tell us. As we talk today, it's the greatest thing we're going to find out from Bob Teedy. And we're going to just hear how many questions did Jesus ask? We're going to go so many different directions talking about questions. But if you call in today and you catch the number of questions that Jesus asked, we're going to give you a copy of one of Bob's books, 866-713-9675. Is there a faith element to every one of Bob's questions? Yeah, I think there is. And our Savior demonstrated the best as asking lots of questions. Bob TD, thanks for coming back, and I work for him. I'm glad we didn't scare you away the first time. Jim and Martha, a delight to be with you today. All right, so I just, you know, I'm, I'm going random right off the front on you. How in the world did you get to be such a big question asker? That's what I want to ask, but I got it. We got it. I didn't ask this last question. The last time we were, you were on the air with this, I never asked it this way. Why did you become a Jesus follower? Well, that's a, a great question. For me, it all started my freshman year at the University of South Dakota. I'd quickly joined a fraternity, and about four or five weeks into that experience, we came down for dinner one night, and there were a group of fraternity men from Iowa State there. We weren't quite sure why they were there, but they were polite, and soon the dinner bell rang. We went into dinner, and our president, just before uh, the meal started, introduced them and said that they were going to be our Monday night speakers. And they were fraternity men from Iowa State involved with the student Christian movement there. Well, after dinner, we all went into our living room. And there, uh, three of them shared, uh, I didn't know what a testimony was at that time, but three of them shared their stories of how they had become followers of Jesus at Iowa State. And the four speaker shared the four spiritual laws. And when he finished, he's shared a prayer and said, if this prayer expresses the desire of your heart, I'd encourage you to pray along silently. I did. Fast forward, though, my next connection with, with Campus Crusade for Christ was the Chicago Christmas Conference, which took place three, four months later. And there's a story of how, I, how that all worked to get there. But the last night, the speaker said, some of you come from campuses where we have no staff. That was true at the University of South Dakota. He said, we wish we had staff to send to all your campuses, but we don't. So we're praying that God will call many of you to lead the movement on your campus. If you're willing to do that, I'd ask you to stand. I remember standing. I knew almost nothing. <laughs> but I've heard later that the greatest ability any of us can give is availability. That's the only one I had. But when people say, how are you called to be a part of Campus Crusade for Christ? I said, well, let me tell you the first step. It was that night at that conference. All the steps since then were a result of that. Maybe one more quick story. I remember Bill Bright asking, this was in a conference, so he was asking all of us. He said, what is the greatest thing that's ever happened to you? Well, if you become a follower of Christ, it's, I know Christ is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Well, his second question, he was leading with questions, Jim and Martha. His second question is, what's the greatest thing you could do for another? Well, it would be to introduce them to Christ. 
And uh, all of those things together, when Sherry and I, my wife became a believer through Campus Crusade also at the University of South Dakota, when we graduated, we joined the staff of Campus Crusade for Christ. That was 1971. It's uh, 49 years later. Obviously, your new friend, Bob, has no ability to get a new job. <laughs> <laughs> well, that interview question I give, gave you ahead of time won't really help them, will it? <laughs> oh, that is so good. So, you know, it's intriguing to me that you remember the questions that Bill Bright asked. And do you think that um, that is something that was kind of ingrained in you, is this, this desire to be led by questions? Or where did that come from? Oh, Martha, that, that is a, you're asking a great question. I wish I could say yes. The truth is, and you know, the first chapter of my, my newest book, now that's a great question, starts, the first chapter is a confession. And in that book, I share that for most of my career, looking back, I realize now I was a benevolent dictator. And, and because my only paradigm of leadership was that a leader needed to tell, a leader needed to direct. And, uh, but I love my staff and the benevolent part was I grew up in a home where I was taught to say please and thank you. So it wouldn't have been, hey, Martha, go do this. Hey, hey Martha, could you please, mm. you know, do this? And, and when Martha did it, Martha, thank you. In fact, in a staff meeting, Martha, stand up. You all need to know how Mar what Martha did this week. It was incredible. And, and I don't wanna say we didn't get anything done but my only paradigm of leadership was that a leader needed to give direction. And then for me in 2006, I discovered a book called Leading with Questions by Dr. Michael Marquardt. And I had no idea that buying that book would not only change my leadership, but would give direction in many ways to the rest of my life. I took that book home, it was a page turner. And for the first time in my life, I saw another paradigm of leadership. In fact, one that could be three to 10 times more effective by leading with questions, whereby, you know, if a leader feels like he or she has to have all the answers, they're only accessing one brain and that's their own. But a leader who turns to their staff and says, hey, Jim, Martha, you know, let's imagine a whole team gathered around a conference table. What do you all think we might do? And then they listen. Well, invariably, you're going to hear ideas you hadn't thought of. Mm -hmm. and, and when Martha shares an idea and you thought, not only haven't I heard of that, that's, an that's so much better than anything I would have come up with. And you lean forward and say, hey, Martha great idea. Would you be willing to lead our team to execute on that? Wow, Martha, the Marthas of the world <laughs> are not only going to feel like, wow, I'm appreciated, but the energy they're going to put forth on making sure the idea they had gets executed with excellence is going to be like 10 times greater than if Bob says, Martha, I need you to do, you know, what I said. And Martha's thinking, well, he's the boss. He writes the paychecks. Okay, but I think it's a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> now we're talking today with Bob Teedy. Check him out online. His website is, well, I got to make sure I, I didn't, oh my gosh, that was just terrible. I didn't know. Here we go. Let's see. Leading, <laughs> Leading with, with questions. Dot com. Com. Oh, sorry. I just, just told blank. <laughs> Leading with questions. Dot com. I'm sorry about what that, What is Bob. the website? We could ask the question. Yeah. What Leading is the with questions. Dot com. And you can get a copy of his fantastic new book. Now, that's a great question. Call into the listener line, 866-713-9675, and tell us the number of questions that Jesus asked out of the Gospels. And it may be on a screen near you, and we may mention it later. <laughs> we may mention it later on the podcast. How many questions did Jesus ask? Hats off to Mrs. Connie Johnson, my eighth grade English grammar teacher. She taught me how to write sentences so that I could one day write a blog. In fact, every week I write a blog from what my father has laid on my heart. It's always short and to the point, and I hope impactful for you just like it is impactful for me. We include it in our weekly email that also includes all the shows that we release on podcast that week. So it's kind of like a bonus email, blog and podcast links. Awesome. Iworkforhim.com. Click on blog. All right, Bob. On our last show, you talked about being a teller. That was a great story. What kind of work are you doing today? 
Okay, you're technically of retired age. If you've been working at Crew for almost 50 <laughs> years, you're of retirement age. What keeps you going, and what God, what's God got for you now? Well, let me come around the barn in answering that just a bit. Have, have you all ever heard that the word retire doesn't appear in the scriptures? Yeah, that's exactly, unless you're a Levitical priest, and it really was just a transition <laughs> thing. That's okay, correct. Okay, well... The fact is, Bill Bright, I, I remember him putting his arm around me once, and, and uh, I don't remember the context, but he was saying, Bob, you know the word retired does not appear in the scriptures. Mm. Now, Jim, you actually referred to it. A couple of years ago, I was reading through the Old Testament, every single verse. I came to the book of Numbers. I continued through Numbers, and I got to Numbers chapter 8, verse 24, and it was about the Levites, but it says, men 25 years old, shall come to take part in the work at the tent of meeting. But at age 50, they must retire. In black and white, the word retire was there. I'd been told the word retire didn't appear in the scriptures. The only now, in, place. Fair, in fairness to Bill Bright and others, it's only the New International Version that translates that passage with the word retire. Others have ceased their labors. But here's why I went there. I love the next verse. It says, but they, referring to the Levites who at age 50 had to retire, but they may continue to assist their younger brethren, yet they themselves must not do the work of service. Mm. Well, and it's so important. Many, yeah. yeah, many commentaries actually think that once they reach 50, it was the 50-plus-year-old Levites that went back and trained those in training from like 15 to 25 to be Levites. Well, that passage doesn't apply to all believers everywhere, but for me, it was a word picture. And, and what I also love is, yes, it gives at 25 start, at 50 retire, but then you can continue, but there's not another number. It doesn't say, and quit that at 65 or quit that at 70. It's like, as long as God gives them health, sound mind, sound body, they could continue to assist their younger brethren. So, Jim and Martha, I have the wonderful privilege of being on the U.S. leadership development team for CREW, and it's a team, not Bob alone. Our mission is simple, developing the next generation of leaders for CREW. And my role on that team, and I absolutely love it, is to recruit outstanding leaders from outside of CREW to coach CREW leaders. And, and they make a commitment to do this for two years, to coach that crew leader every other week for two years. And we currently have three teams doing this. We have actually a combined 103 outside leaders coaching 103 crew leaders. Mm -hmm. And Martha, guess how they coach? They coach using... Question. Yes. Excellent. Where did they get that idea? <laughs> <laughs> this is not the football coach calling the play in from the sideline. But rather, the coach just simply, like Martha, if you were coaching me, your first question would be, Bob, what do you want us to work on today? Mm -hmm. Signal. We're not just talking. It's time to go to work. Mm -hmm. And I lay something out there, and Martha says, wow, tell me more about that. And I think, well, Martha's interested. Well, she is, but she actually knows that if Bob will say more in answering her question, I'll begin to understand my problem better. <laughs> and, and then Martha will say, well, Bob, what's the goal? And if I say, well, I'd just like to get a little better, Martha will give a polite laugh, refer back to our training, and say, well, that sounds kind of like the weasel response. Give me a how much by when. In other words, a measurable goal. And what Martha's really helping me determine is the destination. Where do I want to go? Her next question would be, well, Bob, in relation to that, where are you at now? It's, it's really like navigating a map. You got to know where you want to go, where you're at now. I realize with Garmin and navigation tools, it's not quite like it used to be, but it figures out where you are, but you have to tell it where you want to go. And then Martha said, well, Bob, what's your plan to get from here to there? And, and by just using a set of questions, Martha actually helps coach me and moves me down the line. Well, at any rate, the privilege of having 103 outside terrific leaders, they come from business, uh, education, military, government, nonprofits. They're all strong believers, but they're leading in one of those roles. Mm. 
That's so good. And what a great example. And I hope our listeners are, you know, thinking, how can I apply that maybe in what I'm doing today? And one of the ways that you can do that is by calling and getting copy of, now that's a great question. Call our listener line 866-713-9675 and make sure you tell us the number of questions that Jesus asked. <laughs> but um, as also, I want to point people to the website because I know that they can re, um, get to a lot of your resources there and that's leadingwithquestions.com. So listeners, this is an, a resource that my goodness, it's a gold mine. So take advantage of it. Look, use it in your own life and then imagine how it can apply to all the people that you're leading as well, even in the family, right? Bob, don't you think that um, questions is a great way to open up conversation for family? Oh, a absolutely. When somebody says, you know, Bob, I'm not a leader. Do you have friends? Do you have family? You, you don't have to be in a leadership position in, in quotes mm -hmm. to make effective use of questions. I, I know one mom, for example, one day it just occurred to her that every night the bedtime routine, she was saying, okay, you know, it's eight o'clock, time to get your pajamas on. Okay, now it's time to go brush your teeth. Now it's time to, we'll have the story. Now it's time to get into bed. Now it's time to say our prayers. And one night it just occurred to her, wait a minute, she said to her children, it's eight o'clock. What do we do at eight o'clock? And they said, we get our pajamas on. She said, oh, brilliant. And, and they got their pajamas on. Now what do we do? We brush our teeth. And she just used questions. And uh, so there, there's just one thing. There's so many times we give direction to our kids. They actually know the answers if we just ask. That's right. And, uh, oh, fast forward. Uh, one of my granddaughters, when she was little, was just standoffish. I mean, I'd, I'd grab her sometimes and hold her, and she was fine with that, but she didn't come on her own. And one day, I just had this idea. I said, Claire, can I ask you a tough question? And without saying any word, she just nodded. I said, come here. She came, got on my lap. And I asked her, you know, some probably silly question like, you know, when eight copycats are sitting on a fence and one jumps off, how many are left? And and told her, you know, that joke, and she loved it. And then it was Claire, now it's your turn to ask me a tough question. Well, for many years, that was our routine. Whenever we were together, I'd say, Claire, can I ask you a tough question? And it just opened up the communication. These weren't deep, deep questions, but she loved answering questions and then asking me questions. And, and how old is Claire today? Claire is 13 today, and, and we still ask each other questions. Hey, we're talking today with Bob Teedy. You can check him out online, leadingwithquestions.com, leadingwithquestions.com. Again, we're going to give away a copy of his latest book. Now, that's a great question. If you can tell us the number of questions that Jesus asked, as noted in the gospel, and as noted in Bob's book, Blah, 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 the number of questions that Jesus asked. <laughs> it's part of the title. So that's, that's right, it's part of the title. All right, but we're, we're, we're going to take a break. We'll be right back with more from Bob Teedy. <laughs> if I had my way on every I Work For Him road trip, I'd spend all my time in the passenger seat on Facebook and Instagram. But Jim insists that I drive for at least an hour every day so he can nap. Perhaps you'd like to stay connected with all that Jim and I and I Work For Him are up to. Check us out on Facebook and Instagram for all the latest and special events, podcasts, and conversations. Just search for I Work For Him. That's I Work The Number Four Him. All right, we're back with Bob Teedy. And Bob, before we run out of time, because it, this has been so much fun, I want to make sure that we you publish a blog that people need to get signed up for. And, it, and the blog is called Great Leaders Ask Questions. And you, well, that's your your. That you're, you're, excuse me, asking great questions is the blog, isn't it? I got this all of a sudden. Leading, leading, leading with, with questions. questions. Why did they have that? I'm really struggling. Leading with questions dot com. Okay. Because, because great leaders to ask because him. great Here's leaders ask questions. Bob, what the heck is the name of your blog? <laughs> <laughs> it is leadingwithquestions.com. Just run that together. Leadingwithquestions.com and you'll be there. And then you and can subscribing, sign up. Subscribing subscribing is free. We're now in our eighth year. And uh, we're followed by leaders in 190 countries. It's, it's incredible. I, I don't even know how it's possible, but I, I'm wise enough to hit publish 
and there it goes to leaders in 190 countries and would love listeners today to join uh, that group of leaders. And there's, there's so much good stuff that you share in those. And it always surprises me. I mean, you are such a great example of collaboration because it's not just your questions. You share the questions that other people have asked. And um, so, you know, we, we were talking, we delved into it a little bit, you know, instead of uh, being a teller, which is what most of us do, even in the saying, you need to sign up for the blog. You know, we want to, we want to just get there and we well, realize you think, that. Uh, we, should you sign up for the blog? <laughs> but no telling here. We want to actually ask you this question. So what is something that you want to share with our listeners today that you can challenge or encourage them through a question? Well, you sent me this question ahead of time and, and I've thought about it. And here's the thing I'd like to share. How many, here's the question I'd like to ask listeners. How many of you would like to learn to lead with questions in 30 seconds? The reason I ask this is sometimes, like when I'm speaking, I get the sense from an audience that they would like to learn to lead with questions, but they imagine they'll have to get a master's degree in questionology. In other words, it's probably not going to happen, even though it would be a good thing. And so when they hear this question, how would you like to learn to lead with questions in 30 seconds? Every hand goes up. So I'm looking at my audience today, and, and there's Jim. Jim, I'm going to call you up here. And uh, the reason I'm calling you up here to be the, the, the test pilot here is uh, I sent you a photographic memory. And you're only going to have to hear my four favorite questions one time, and you'll have them memorized. Now, Martha, you keep your eye on the clock to see if we can do this in 30 seconds. Okay. All right. You ready, Jim? Uh-huh. Here's my first question. What do you think? My second, what else? My third, what else? My fourth, what else? Jim, <laughs> do you have them memorized? I do. What do you think, Bob? What else? What, what, what else? What else? You got them. Yay. You have a big hand. Now, some listeners are thinking, oh, you can't do that. You can't ask somebody, what do you think? What else? What else? What else? Well, of course, not in that rapid fashion. But you ask somebody, hey, Martha, what do you think about? And there's some topic. Well, Martha's going to answer. And when she pauses, you say, wow, Martha, what else? You see, when somebody asks us, what do we think? Our first answer, just instinctively, not with thought, but instinctively, is we roll out that first safe answer just to see how they will treat that first answer. And if I ask Martha, what do you think? And she gives me an answer. And I say, well, Martha, that's stupid. Everyone knows that. Well, she's sorry she answered at all. That's right. I'm not going to get one more thing. Ever. Not her. Ever. You never. Yeah, ever. Not even the next time. That's right. But, but when I say, wow, Martha, that's good. What, what else? Well, Martha's thinking, you know, this Bob guy's smarter than I think. He actually appreciates what I shared. <laughs> and she'll give me more. And then when she pauses again, Martha, please, don't stop now. I'm taking notes. What else? Mm. And I actually find that we get to Martha's or whoever we're asking, their gold nugget, when we ask the third and fourth question. And so if you've been a leader or just a friend who – tells and you'd like to learn to lead with questions the cool thing is you don't have to memorize a bunch of long complicated questions it's as simple as asking somebody what do you think we might do and then when they pause wow what else and what else and take that into your next conversation take that into your if you are a leader your next one-on-one -on -one conversation or the next time your team is sitting around the table gang, what do you think we might do? And then what else? And, you know, one of the little keys there, before I understood this, there were so many times I probably did ask people, hey, Martha, what do you think? And she gave me that first answer. And I said, oh, great. And I moved on. In other words, I never understood that the gold nugget was just had to dig just oh. a little deeper mm -hmm. to get there. Mm -hmm. And so I missed a whole lot of gold nuggets, I'm sure. So, Bob, you're always working on something. And as you say, you're not planning on retiring because you're not a Levitical <laughs> priest, so therefore you don't qualify. What, what's on tap for you in 2021? What, what big project are you working on? What, what's God laid on your heart? Well, we have uh, two book projects that are being worked on. 
Uh, the first one is done. It's really at this point just a matter of, uh, you know, taking it through graphics and getting it all ready. And it's actually going to be a booklet. And it's going to be the little book of big leading with questions, question, or sorry, leading, I'm sorry, I'm champs, I have the title wrong. The little book of big leading with questions, quotes. It's a book all about quotes on the value of either asking or listening to, uh, to uh, asking questions or listening to answers. So the little, I'm sorry, the big book. Wow. I'm, okay. I'm well, just like you. But people yeah. be able to find, sorry, it's, like, it's a disease. I don't know what the deal is today. Usually I get that stuff down, but people can find out more about it at leadingwith.com. Yeah. Bob, the last question of the day. The last question of the day, because we're, we're out of time, but I'm going on it anyway. Thanksgiving time, you always send out great questions, the best questions to ask around the table. Well, we didn't get you on the podcast before Thanksgiving, so we want to know, what were the top two questions that people should have been asking around the Thanksgiving table in states where they could actually have Thanksgiving with other people? Or on a Zoom call. Or on a Zoom call. Because those questions we can maybe use around Christmas. So what are the top two questions? What were your finalists for this year? We didn't have a contest this year, but we shared all 25 from the past years. And we had, in other words, five every year. And we, had, we did it five years in a row. So these were the top 25, five from each year. But I took a look, and my two favorite, not necessarily saying these are the top of all 25, but my two favorite. One is, who would benefit from getting a text from you right now thanking them for something they've done for you or something they've taught you. Hmm. And, and just even that activity of pull out the phone and right now text them and just say thank you. The, the second question I loved is think ahead to next Thanksgiving. What are you hoping that you'll be able to thank the Lord for one year from now at next Thanksgiving? Wow. Great questions. Bob T, as always, so much fun. Check out Bob online, leading, leadingwithquestions.com, leadingwithquestions.com. Bob T, thanks for being on iWork for him today. Jim and Martha, it's been my pleasure. This has been lots of fun. You all are great hosts. Well, thank you. <laughs> you've, been, you've been listening to iWork for him with your host, Jim and Martha Brangenberg. We're Christ followers, and our workplace, it's our mission field. But ultimately, I, I work, work for him. him. Thank you for listening to the I Work For Him podcast with your hosts, Jim and Martha Brangenberg. Please visit iWorkForHim.com to learn more about connecting your faith and work, to join the I Work For Him nation, or subscribe to our weekly blog. You can also follow us on social media at iWorkForHim to stay up to date and meet our guests. If today's message spoke to you, please subscribe, rate, and review the show on your favorite podcast platform. Your review will launch more workplace missionaries across America. That's at iWorkForHim and online iWorkForHim.com. I work the number number four, him.com.